afternoon. It is 1400, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the August Innovation Connect hosted by the Department of the Air Force Chief Data and AI Office. My name is Lindsay Mask. I'm the CDAO Strategic Communications Team Lead, and I'll be today's moderator. The purpose of Innovation Connect is a monthly series that we have to create a collaborative and atmosphere for those working in the DoD to cross pollinate ideas across organizations and also to enhance innovation and identify and solve problems related to R&D and um, scaling. We're excited about today's events. Thank you all for attending. To get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping right. rules. Nobody, nobody from California will be out there because our governor won't. <laughs> if you allow. are not a presenter, names on there. Thank you. If you're not a presenter, please keep your camera off and your microphone on mute. Perfect timing. Our speaker will give an overview of his topic or their topics and followed by a Q&A session. We encourage you to ask questions. Use the chat feature throughout the presentation and you can insert your questions and we will be tracking them. Second, we ask that you keep questions to the topics presented and refrain from media related questions or advertisements for your company or your organization. Questions will be read aloud immediately following the presentation. For this month's Innovation Connect, Director Mr. Matthew Dever at Air Force Cyberspace Technical Center of Excellence at the Air Force Institute of Technology and Mr. Matthew Jacobson, a software engineering technical lead in the materials and manufacturing directorate of the Air Force Research Laboratory will overview the establishment of the first formal software factory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Hangar 18. With that, it's my pleasure to properly introduce our speakers, Mr. Dever, currently the director of Psycho at the Air Force Institute of Technology at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. He also serves as the director of communications and outreach for Hangar 18, he's a retired electronic warfare officer with nearly 4,000 hours of aviation experience in eight different aircraft, including B-52G, B-1B, and RC-26B platforms. After retiring, Mr. Dever served as a cyber EW threat analyst at Air Combat Command's Intelligence Directorate and an information operations analyst at the Air Force Targeting Center, Langley Air Force Base. He has a bachelor's in communications from Ohio University, a master's in cybersecurity from the University of Maryland University College, and is a certified information systems security professional. Mr. Jacobson is a software engineering technical lead in the materials and manufacturing directorate of the Air Force Research Laboratory. There he manages efforts in data and software engineering, data governance, and process optimization. Mr. Jacobson is leading an internationally recognized software development program in integrated computation materials science and engineering. This Air Force trademark cyber infrastructure called HyperThought employs state-of-the-art technologies to provide a complete suite of data management and machine integration capabilities to research and manufacturing organizations around the United States. Mr. Jacobson has brought this depth of experience in establishing the first formal software factory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Hangar 18. With that introduction, um, gentlemen, I now pass it over to you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and try to bring my screen up here. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, sorry about the delay there, just having a little technical difficulties. Uh, as Lindsay said, my name is Matt Dever. I'm the director of the Air Force Cyberspace Technical Center of Excellence, uh, kind of a mouthful. We tend to call it the SITECO around AFIT. Uh, that's where we're at, is at the Air Force Institute of Technology. Um, this, uh, I'll kind of go into the brief here. Uh, this uh, organization was uh, established back in 2008, a designation letter from the Secretary of the Air Force and Chief of Staff at the time, uh, based on uh, the good work that the faculty and staff were doing at, uh, at AFIT uh, from, from the 2000s in, in uh, an AFIT level center we call the Cyber Center for Cyberspace Research. Uh, they were doing some really good work there and they were recognized in 2007 and then formally established in 2008 as the Technical Center of Excellence. Um, lots of words there, but basically what it kind of comes down to uh, in our mission statement uh, uh, and I won't read this to you, but uh, these are the things we're trying to get after through innovation and kind of our, our, our pillars are uh, innovation for research, 
uh, cyber education and training, consultation and outreach. And, and that's kind of my charter for the things that I do. Uh, I, I have kind of a uh, fairly liberal uh, uh, way of doing things. AFIT gives me a lot of latitude to get into the things that uh, we think we should be getting into. And that is based on feedback coming from the field from not only the cyber operators, uh, but also uh, uh, the other domains. Uh, how we do a lot of these things, we have a couple production engines uh, that we've formed here, here in the Psycho. Uh, the first one is the Innovation Solutions Team. Uh, that's fairly recently established, and we'll go into that in a little more depth, but we wanted to look at things on, on how we do things on the cloud and uh, uh, looking at video on demand for educational purposes, uh, and also getting into learning theory and gamification on how we can innovate uh, in, uh, in our education delivery. Um, we also have the rapid development team. Uh, this is a team that we formed uh, to kind of get after uh, cyber uh, education requirements uh, based on vague requirements. Uh, you know, in, in the cyber community, uh, it's fairly uh, laid out, but when you start getting into the other domains, uh, there's a lot of other uh, communities in the Air Force that, that have cyber dependencies, but don't have any uh, formal training on what those dependencies are and how to get after those. So that's what the rapid development team was, was stood up uh, to be able to uh, get that information out to those communities with, without um, doing the typical uh, year to two year development of, of curriculum uh, and, and as we know in the cyber world, you know, two years, uh, it's probably going to be overcome by events. So uh, our prototype there was a course called ACVAMP, which is the Avionics Cyber Vulnerability Assessment, Mitigation, and Protection. Um, that was a uh, manual that AFRL uh, Sensors Directorate wrote uh, as we started looking at the cyber vulnerabilities of aircraft. Uh, we took that manual and basically from barroom napkin to the first time we taught it was about three months. And then what we did was kind of use an agile methodology to, to iterate that course uh, to get it up uh, to exactly where it needed to be. I'll go into depth on, on both of these. Uh, first off in the innovation solutions team, um, this is a team that we put together uh, to create uh, a learning platform uh, and here you can see uh, an image of uh, kind of the finished product. It's called Evolve. Uh, it derives its name from ev evolving airmen. Um, but it was, it's been kind of a long journey uh, getting that thing up to speed. Uh, a little background on it. Um, the reason we were looking at it at the time, we were looking in the cyber domain. Uh, and one of our professors at the time, a uh, military professor, uh, and, and now civilian professor with AFIT, Dr. Mark Reith. Uh, he was looking at how do we get cyber technology, uh, you know, uh, to uh, address the, the evolving threats, uh, you know, that, that were happening faster than we could train to them. Um, he proposed to me as the psycho director uh, to start a research project to look at that currency complexity and scalability of the content. Uh, also, and to look into the gamification and learning motivation, what makes that person, that user, want to stay on that application and continue to learn. Uh, another uh, goal of that effort was to, to explore what it means to move to the cloud. And, and we're going back four years now or so. There wasn't a lot of expertise at AFIT on what it does mean to move to the cloud. Uh, so this was kind of a research project for us to, to look at these things. And again, at that time, it was purely a research project. Um, Dr. Reith participated in a design sprint out at the Air Force Academy CyberWorks, uh, along with other organizations, and to come up with a solution on what this thing is. Um, and, and some of the things that they pulled out of that was that, you know, cyber proficiency requires continuous learning, as opposed to just learning and then going out and practicing it without keeping up. Uh, and what they found was airmen need better tools to fit that continuous learning model. Uh, and, and so what they determined was that the students and educators could benefit from th this idea of crowdsourcing content. Um, so we began a research project at the time we called it Cyber Education Hub. And, and as we socialized that with uh, various uh, distinguished vis visitors to AFIT and a lot of our uh, different partners across the institution, what we found was 
many of the other communities wanted exactly the same thing. And that prototype we had put together um, really struck a nerve. Uh, so we decided to change it to a general purpose product, not just necessarily addressing cyber, but education in general, uh, based on those demand signals. And we did have some funding coming in, particularly from the acquisition community. Um, you can see here kind of some snapshots of, of the application. Um, Evolve is, is a force of development platform. Uh, and, and the idea was to improve that accessibility to learning materials. And we're not talking necessarily highly curated uh, learning materials like you would see on ADLS or My Learning, uh, but more user-driven content uh, to allow the different communities to be able to share their content with their peers. Um, it has kind of a Netflix, uh, YouTube uh, look and feel, and that was by design. We wanted to make this thing intuitive. Uh, so that there wasn't, you didn't really need any instructions on how to use it. Uh, and we also protected it uh, with CAC authentication, uh, largely because we didn't want to go through the process of uh, uh, public affairs approval on every piece of content. Uh, so by putting that CAC authentication, we were able to put content up there without PA approval and up to uh, CUI. As I said, we, we had a demand signal, not just from the cyber community, but from many of the communities. So, so we organized the content uh, into hubs uh, based on different subject matter and made the content tag searchable. Uh, as you can see on the image here, we have Cyber Education Hub, which was the start of this, um, but we've also created Acquisition Hub, Recruiter Hub, um, quite a few different hubs. This is, this is a little bit dated on this slide. Um, but the idea was, was uh, to be able to think of those hubs as doorways into content. So if you go through Acquisition Hub, most of the content that it's going to show you is, is, uh, has been tagged uh, that it is uh, of interest to the acquisition community. That doesn't mean that you can't get to other content. Uh, you always can. At the top, you'll see there's a, there's a global search bar that you can get to any content based on those tags. Uh, but, but this was a way to organize the content to make it a little bit easier to get to it. Um, there's been multiple partnerships as we, as we have developed this. Um, like I said, the acquisition community has probably been the biggest proponent, but also recruiting. Uh, we've been working with the Joint AI Center, uh, Half A4 in the aircraft maintenance community. Um, the Cyber Resiliency Office for Weapon Systems has been a big customer of ours. Um, so, so, and it's ever expanding right now. I think we're sitting at just under 5,000, uh, users and it's growing every day. Um, now we started this project about four years ago. And, uh, as some of you probably know, it's not that difficult to build an application, but it's very difficult to get an application, uh, accredited on the dot mill network. Uh, we had tried several avenues to do that. Uh, ultimately we, we, uh, uh, decided on platform one and uh, platform one at the time was kind of in, in its infancy also. Uh, so it was a, <clears throat> a big learning experience for all of us to get, go through that process. <coughs> Excuse me. We got our certi certificate to field on platform one in July of last year and we went live with Evolve uh, in September. Uh, here's the one piece, one functionality in, in Evolve that is probably what, what resonated with every community was this idea of a learning path. Uh, and, and this was kind of an idea of our, one of our graduate students who was working on the program at the time and was doing his thesis work with this. And he had come up with this idea of a learning path to make it very learner centric, uh, competency based. Uh, and, and to be able to string together content on Evolve that had been uploaded to Evolve, string that content together with the goal of uh, achieving a competency or a skill or an ability at the end of the learning path. And the idea there was to let the airmen kind of select what they need and when they need it. And it gives the trainers and supervisors a way to, to define that development options. Uh, it also allows the leadership to be able to, sh to shape and to validate that, that development. Um, so that was Evolve. That's our, probably our biggest uh, uh, innovation effort that's been going on now for about four years. And it's uh, uh, take, honestly takes up a lot of our time uh, with that innovation solutions team. We have a team of about 
uh, five software developers, some user-centered design designers, uh, and, and they spend the lion's share of their time on that. But some of the other things that we're doing from an innovation uh, standpoint is looking into this idea of serious games. And serious games basically are games that you can play that have uh, defined learning objectives uh, that you can measure at the end of playing the game to see if their knowledge has gotten better. Uh, Battle Space Next here, you'll see uh, that was created by one of our graduate students, and we have turned into a dig digitized version of that. And the idea there is to uh, uh, enforce uh, how cyber can be uh, worked into a military operation. And it's kind of the, the, the idea is to give the, the user an idea of how you would leverage cyber uh, in, in, a, in a wartime footing. Uh, obsolescence is a game uh, kind of the same, but it is, uh, it's getting after uh, artificial intelligence. And again, created by one of our graduate students, uh, it, it's a game to kind, to kind of uh, show how artificial intelligence uh, can be put into a military con context. Uh, one of the other ones is Cyberspace Odyssey. This has been a very successful game for us. We use it with our ACE cadets that I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, but Cyberspace Odyssey is really geared towards the cyber community. Um, and it is a game that uh, teaches uh, cryptography and also how to use uh, the uh, networking tool uh, Wireshark. Wireshark is an integral part of that game. And in the game, the students fly spaceships uh, by space stations where they capture packets and they have to decode messages to get a clue to move on to the next thing. Uh, so we're in the process of getting Cyberspace Odyssey moved to the cloud uh, to make that available to, to uh, the masses. Uh, another innovation, uh, we have the Helix boxes. This was a creation by one of our contract researchers that the Psycho funds. Uh, the Helix box is a hardware in the loop training system that takes a Raspberry Pi and a program logic controller uh, to simulate um, uh, industrial control systems. Uh, so you can program that Raspberry Pi. We, we, we have some that are prison in a box. Some of them are uh, water treatment plant in a box, uh, many different scenarios that we can put in there. And we build these things for about six or $700 a piece, uh, very inexpensive. Uh, and, and we use these uh, with, with training and we've also built and shipped these out to a number of universities and a number of uh, cyber uh, units throughout the Air Force, and they've been very successful for us. Uh, moving on to the rapid development team. Uh, so this is the team that was put together to kind of get after uh, big requirements uh, for the different communities. Uh, you can kind of see here a little bit of a synopsis. This is a little bit of a dated slide, but there's a, there's a number of things on here that they've been doing. Uh, for the most part, this team has been funded and utilized uh, by the Cyber Resiliency Office for Weapon Systems, or CROWS, if you guys have heard that, uh, the cyber focus teams. Uh, so we, we take a lot of our uh, um, guidance from them as to what they want created. As I said, the uh, uh, ACTVAMP course was kind of our prototype course. Uh, it is now an official course, and AFIT uh, School of System and Logistics uh, administer that course. Now it's called SIS 240. Uh, and we've had, I think, over 3,000 graduates of that course uh, that's the one that's looking at uh, how do we uh, how do we uh, look at the vulnerabilities of our aircraft. Um, we just had our first beta offering of the SSE Cyber Practitioners course uh, for the Crows, and and that's kind of getting after that program protection plan and looking at the cyber guidebook that the Crows have put out there. Uh, bottom line is the RDT is trying to provide immediate and emerging uh, educational needs, and and while we're doing that, we look at what is the long term. Uh, prospect of that course, and if it is going to be long term, we look at the sustainable solutions that we can, we, where we can put it. Uh, one other uh, recent development in the rapid development team is the support to the civil engineering school. Uh, so the civil engineers out there, uh, you know, are getting more and more cyber dependencies as their HVAC systems and things are all uh, uh, computer controlled, and they're being asked to uh, to maintain these and to uh, protect them. So uh, we added to the rapid development team, uh, we brought in an industrial control systems expert, and he has uh, done a great job for us over the last year, year, year and a half, uh, inserting uh, cybersecurity education into the curriculum of the Civil Engineering School. Uh, and he's also about to launch uh, WENG 270, uh, Advanced Control System Cybersecurity, which is the first 
uh, dedicated cyber class for the civil engineering community. It's about a week long. Uh, and they used uh, they use uh, some of those helix boxes and also what we call the mist kits, uh, the mobile ICS security trainers, so that those civil engineers can get hands on training with the equipment they're expected to to uh, uh, operate. Uh, one other thing uh, that we do here in the psycho for AFIT, um, we uh, developed and we maintain what we call the cyber defense network or CDN. Uh, that's a standalone network, uh, private, you know, closed network that we have at AFIT. Uh, it does have internet connectivity, uh, and it is ex extensively used for cyber research. It has all kinds of malware on that and all those things that you can't do on the AFNet uh, that we allow the students to do on this network. Um, and it provides a great resource, not only for the graduate curriculum, uh, but also, also for uh, the PCE classes in both uh, School of System Logistics and also the School of Strategic Force Studies, who are the ones who execute Cyber 200 and 300 uh, for the cyber, uh, cyber warfare folks. Uh, the center also provides funding for uh, three research engineers that have been on staff for a number of years now. Uh, one of them uh, actually got his PhD while at AFIT, uh, working for the Psycho. Uh, he now does uh, some adjunct uh, professor duties with some of the classes you'll see listed there. I'm not going to go through all of these, but they have different uh, different expertise in different areas in the cybersecurity standpoint. Uh, Steve Dunlap, you see there in the bottom left, uh, he is the gentleman who created the Helix boxes, um, and uh, he uses those uh, uh, to uh, support the uh, graduate faculty uh, with a lot of their courses. Um, bottom line with these folks, uh, it improves our visibility among the research community, uh, the quality and continuity of faculty and student. Uh, so when I say continuity of faculty and students, sometimes the faculty will have some long term research that is going to span two or three students over successive uh, you know, academic years. And, and these folks uh, pr provide that continuity to keep the research uh, uh, to keep the research going. Uh, last thing I'll talk about here is uh, advanced cyber edu education. Some of you may or may not have heard of this. We call it ACE. Uh, it is not uh, uh, part of the ACE program up at Rome, New York, but it was born from that program. Uh, the ACE program, uh, we bring in anywhere from 35 to 50 ROTC cadets from the Army and Air Force, uh, and we bring them in for a cyber boot camp for 28 days. Uh, they get to learn things about the avionics aspects, industrial controls, uh, network warfare, cyber ops, uh, all those things. Uh, we just completed uh, this year's course uh, last Friday. We had 35 cadets, uh, and those cadets came from all over the country. Uh, we actually had a cadet from Hawaii, a cadet from Alaska, and also from Puerto Rico. Um, it's a very successful program, and we've had a number of AFIT students come back for their master's who are previous ACE, ACE graduates. They come in uh, between their, their uh, junior and senior year of college. So that's, uh, that's been a pr pretty successful program for us. Okay, that's kind of the site go in a uh, short nutshell of all the things. We have a lot of things going on at the site go. Uh, but one of the biggest, uh, most exciting things from our aspect uh, that we're doing right now uh, from an uh, aspect of outreach and consultation is we have partnered up with uh, Mr. Jacobson and uh, from his organization at AFRL RX, uh, he has a software development team and we have a software development team. Uh, and it was just logical for us to get together um, to form this partnership to stand up uh, Wright Patterson's uh, software factory Hangar 18. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Jacobson. Thanks, Matt Dever. And thank you guys for having us today. Uh, we are excited to show you guys. Uh, a bit about what we're doing with this thing called Hangar 18. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yep. Got awesome. It. Thank you so much for confirming. Yeah, as uh, uh, Lindsay indicated, my name is Matt Jacobson, uh, background in software and data engineering. And um, much like Matt Dever presented the Evolve platform that his team has been working on, my team has been working on a enterprise knowledge management um, and data interrogation platform called HyperThought, uh, Air Force trademark, um, designed using um, 
an agile methodology and implement using an agile methodology, DevSecOps principles and tools. Um, and so it just seemed really natural for the two of us when when uh, different organizations at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base came together um, early last year. Uh, you know, as it turns out, there were many pockets of innovation in agile DevSecOps and cloud utilization uh, at, at, at our installation, which was no surprise. Um, however, Matt and I both leaned forward and <laughs> we uh, uh, made the most noise. So uh, here we are uh, working together to build this software factory, bootstrapping uh, what we're doing now off of the experiences that we've had uh, in our other um, in our other projects. So we'll go over a little bit of our overview. Um, and we say that creating a formal software factory at Right Path uh, was a, a, a good investment of our time, low risk, um, and just a potential to meet an enormous wave of demand signals inside the community uh, for help looking for a preferred partner in, in digital engineering and digital transformation. We'll talk a little bit about what we mean by that. Uh, hopefully we won't, we won't uh, uh, tee up a huge firestorm debate over uh, the term digital engineering or anything like that um, in the chat. Although, you know, uh, flame wars in the chat are kind of fun. And we've had that before with some of our other large uh, community calls like this. Um, so yeah, we'll talk a little bit, little bit about how we uh, how we came to be, and it's also worth noting that uh, we want to acknowledge the uh, great work the other factories are doing, uh, and and many of them have done in setting up this this model of a software factory. Um, today probably we don't have time to do it, but uh, one of the individuals on our team has spent a good bit of time um, quantifying what it means to be a software factory from an operational perspective, what types of processes are used, how the culture is formed, what self-assembling actually looks like, and how value is delivered. And the really cool part, here's a sneak peek, the really cool part about the model is that it, it, it works, first of all, but it's also interesting that by allowing these factories to self-assemble, many of them pick up the same patterns of behavior and, and the same characteristics in terms of how they do business uh, how they uh, matrix resources and solve problems and and work with funding and and, and generate advocacy. So, um, and I also say this because we are not the only factory at Right Pat. I want to recognize that uh, uh, we have uh, Weapon One and Rogue One, um, and they do a lot of great work as well. Um, we want to be very technically precise in saying that we got on the map uh, there on the, on the uh, software.factory. Uh, sorry, sorry, software.af.mil site um, by working directly with the CSO's office. Um, but there are a lot of undeclared software factories that do a lot of great work too. So as I said, we were part of a group of uh, workshops that occurred early last year um, in an attempt to say, hey, let's get Dayton, Ohio on the map. You know, we got these aliens here at the base. Uh, let's uh, let's take this legend and and uh, bring it uh, back to life here uh, in the form of a software factory. So that's what we've done. Um, it's a combination of uh, myself and Matt Dever and our organizations and a, and a host of other individuals that we'll, we'll look at here in just a minute. Uh, but I myself am from the Materials and Manufacturing Directorate uh, in the Air Force Research Lab. Um, and as Matt said, he's from the SiteCo. Uh, and we stepped forward and said, let's, let's do this. So what's interesting, and you'll see this as we as we talk about what, what Hangar 18 actually is, is that um, we are we have been uh, assigned to the Hangar 18 uh, project, uh, this venture, by our organizations. Um, my billet is still owned by uh, Air Force Mantech. That's AFRL RXM. Um, and Matt's billet is still owned by it through the, the site co. But we were both working very, very uh, diligently with our team to build up this uh, this software factory. It's an in interesting model. We can talk a little, little bit about the pros and cons of, of that approach, um, but that's where we are. Um, so that leads me into this slide, which uh, basically talks about the fact that we are a federation of um, individuals, military and civilian, who are on assignment to Hangar 18. Their organizations continue to own their billets. Uh, we track work uh, very carefully using a variety of different productivity tools on the teams that they are matrix to and the projects they work on so that we can give have, have great reporting back to their leadership uh, so that they are incentivized to continue working with us because they're rewarded for the merits of their contribution uh, to the factory. Um, and what we look at when we look at here specifically, our mission statement is to take Agile and DevSecOps and really bring those to bear inside the digital engineering and digital transformation communities. So what does that mean? I have a whole slide on that here in just a minute. Um, but this being a group that, that seems very focused on data, I think you'll appreciate this. We look at something like, like source code management and you look at how that's evolved over the decades and where we are right now with tools like uh, GitLab and, and all, the, all the awesome functions that are presented. I mean, you can, you can do a lot of uh, uh, sprint management now in, in Git, um, automation, container management, 
and monitoring, all that is possible. Um, where's, where's the analog for data? Do we have an analog for data? Uh, we really don't. There are commercial tools out there uh, for sure that purport themselves to be data management solutions um, across different domains. Sometimes it's materials, sometimes it's aerospace, sometimes it's human factors. It depends on what it is. Um, but there's not a great analog to what we've learned in the DevSecOps community and the Agile community uh, when it comes to delivering data. And especially when we look at the the problem of data inside the, the DOD, specifically the Air Force, there's a huge there's a huge opportunity for us to um, accelerate how we do business. You know, when we look at the A10 as one example, here's a problem statement: Fairchild Republic is no longer around, um, but those aircraft are still in the air, and the longer they stay in the air, the more expensive they become to maintain. So. Um, the, the operational effectiveness and availability of the fleet uh, is at stake when we start talking about how we manage um, the data. How do we how do we inspect, repair, um, do all these MRO operations on our fleet, on our aircraft, uh, and be effective and efficient as an organization? Data is a huge driver of that, a huge driver of that. And even as we enter into new landscapes, um, we have stake project stakeholders who, who are most certainly missing opportunities uh, to do data governance and data management and exploiting their data in a better way. So what we've said as Hangar 18 is we want to take what we've learned in the, from the software side about Agile and DevSecOps and really bring those to bear inside the data community um, because those are such huge drivers of success when we look at efforts in digital engineering and digital transformation more generically. I'll just take the take a second to talk when we talk about digital engineering. I know it's a hot uh, kind of a hot topic. For us at Hangar 18, what our concern is is less on specific applications and more about integration along the life cycle. Um, so if you're building a if you're doing CAD or CAE work, um, the data that you're that you're building and delivering needs to be uh, as integratable as possible. It needs to be as interoperable as possible. Neutral formats, good documentation, um, regular delivery. Of, uh, of 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 the tech data uh, and confirmation uh, by the, uh, the 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 recipient of the data, the consumer uh, is one example of that. So anywhere where we see a need for integration or systems integration, potentially between a material management system and an engineering design system or a product lifecycle management system, uh, those types of interchanges can end up sinking the ship if we don't uh, account for them early on in the life cycle. So again. This is where Hangar 18 comes in and says, we have a lot of experience in both of these in building uh, software applications, but also in, in helping deliver plans and executing plans for, uh, uh, for managing and executing data. So we do this in one of three ways. One is that we can build tools and tool pipelines outright. We can integrate people in with our Git-based our, uh, uh, Git CI-CD pipeline in the cloud is one example. Uh, we can build greenfield applications and we do this over a variety of different domains um, and a variety of different sizes and sizes and flavors. Um, we can build things uh, in, 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 in desktop clients, um, uh, full stack applications, uh, less so embedded systems, but it's an area that we're starting to look into. Uh, but in the, at the end of the day, we are building the capability. Um, that's a very common use case, probably half of the work that we do um, or more, 60%, maybe 70%. <clears throat> we can also guide technical efforts. One of the things that we see, there's a lot of, th there's a lot of folks who are conversant in the ideas behind something like Agile and they know they want to use it but they're not sure what to look for specifically. Can they look at a product backlog, for example, and see if it's been properly decomposed and right-sized? Can they, can they develop a sense of confidence in the relative estimations of the people doing the work uh, inside, of a, inside of a certain sprint? Um, these are skills that come with training and experience. Uh, and so Hangar 18, what we'd like to do is work with uh, project stakeholders to educate them and to work side by side with them to make sure they're getting what uh, they need that they're getting maximal value out of a dollar spent. Um, so again, they may not be the experts in DevSecOps, Cloud, and Agile, uh, but they can work with experts from Hangar 18, uh, again, to, to lower their risk and, and, and speed up the delivery of value. And then in the last case, educating the workforce. Our partnership with AFIT, AFIT being uh, one half of Hangar 18, uh, brings to bear faculty and content, um, again, across a wide uh, array of uh, depths and breadths um, that makes us very, very effective for us to set up workshops, colliders, uh, enroll people in formal coursework, um, and also take uh, students at AFID who are pursuing, pursuing degree programs and plugging them in uh, to uh, live programs, which is really, really exciting. I mean, if you can imagine being a graduate student studying something like model-based systems engineering, perhaps you have skills in this, you're honing those skills, rather than giving you a textbook, 
we're going to take you in a, and put you on a, a pre Vanguard or a Vanguard program where you can work with other professionals in this area, uh, learning from them and also helping teach them their, your skills. We see that as being a major uh, uh, force multiplier in how we change the workforce, how we do workforce development um, and, and maximize our, the, the human capital side of things, which truly I think is, is our biggest limiting factor. Uh, the tools are here. You know, if, if all we did was model what we did after industry, uh, we would go a long way um, in, in becoming more organizationally efficient. So what's our biggest barrier? I, I think, and I think the rest of Hangar team would agree with me that uh, the biggest problem we have is around culture um, and workforce development. Um, so uh, yeah, that's what we're about. Uh, that mission statement there, and then those three ways of, of how we actually deliver those capabilities. I won't spend a lot of time on here. Actually, the biggest thing I'd like to focus on is those value statements down there. This is more, uh, a little bit more fine-grained presentation of what I just described, which is the desire to empower um, airmen to solve their own problems. Um, so that, again, our goal with like one of those consulting engagements is to empower a decision maker with the skills they need. Um, and it may not be, they may not become, you know, world-class experts in it during the process, but to feel more confident that they can assess delivery uh, of data and, and software assets under a contract, for example, or better yet to write those contract requirements in at the beginning. Um, that's a great way to solve a lot of these problems. So what Hangar 18 then does is make sure that the infrastructure and the network of support is in place. So that when an empowered project manager, program manager, decision maker goes and writes a contract deliverable the way they want it, they don't have to guess at the mechanism for making that happen. Hangar 18 is there to say, yeah, we have the systems, we have the pipelines, we have the expertise to help you and your contractor satisfy what has been stated under this, under this contract. So again, real quick, you can see that we've gone through, we haven't been around all that long. In fact, we were only formally recognized um, at the end of last September. So we're coming up on a year of activity here. And one of the things we had to do is figure out who, who we are. Um, that, that, that data is a, that data aspect and delivering DevSecOps and Agile to digital engineering and digital transformation um, is something that we had to refine and really hone and use different projects that we've engaged in. You know, one of the things we said is, you know what, let's get in the trenches again. Let's get into the trenches and apply these things and see what we learn and let, let that be our exercise for forming up uh, this mission statement. And it's evolved over time for sure. You know, Matt, Deborah and I are saying, yeah, let's do a software factory. Okay, <laughs> how do we do a software factory? Uh, I have no idea. Matt, do you have any idea? I have no idea. Okay, well, let's let's uh, get the teams together um, and start working projects together and see what falls out. And so that's what we did. And, and I think, again, it was really effective. And um, I think for me early on, you know, it, one lesson learned for those of you who are kind of curious about this, you know, uh, what some of the success factors have been you know, when you look at that sort of tri that 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 trifold um, uh, approach to solving problems, there's risk there. You're splitting yourself out over three modes of doing business. Um, and I was warned or cautioned early on uh, by a couple of different advisors that that was a, a potential very risky thing. So I admit going into this that it was like, how are we going to balance this? But that again, the nice thing is, is that we found a really nice sweet spot in um, educating people while we're executing uh, work on their behalf and delivering value. So it is a very effective model. When you look across the different landscape of what we work on, and in just a, just a second, I have a lay of the land slide that'll talk about some, some numbers, put some numbers behind this. The work that we do generally breaks into one of these four areas. We're building uh, and delivering under Agile and DevSecOps practice. We're educating and training and we're, and we're building platforms and pipelines for ourselves and for others which I'm sure you guys will appreciate when a production development team, or I should say a development team building production capabilities is establishing a CI CD pipeline for themselves, just like we have for our two teams, um, scaling up to include other members of the citizen developer workforce makes a lot of sense. And that's been one of our big, um, big benefits of how we are doing our business is that as we grow our capabilities in the cloud with things like productivity tools and, and, and software delivery pipelines, um, We've been able to reach out to the citizen development community. And just to be clear, what I mean is that we, we have we have thousands of people who are um, highly specialized over physics, chemistry, material science, aerospace engineering, human factors, uh, who are proficient at, at coding for specific applications. Uh, but they may not be very well acquainted with tools like Git, 
Um, very rarely are they acquainted with productivity tools like Jira and Confluence. Uh, and, the, and, and the techniques around Agile that might make their jobs easier in terms of how they decompose their own work and report it back to their, their leadership and decision makers. Um, so as we build out these capabilities for ourselves, we continue to grow and grow more of that community and bring them on board. But that I skip, purposely skipped over the second uh, horizontal there, uh, data engineering. This is one that's emerged. We have, um, we've been rolling out on our, our line of, of uh, prototype practitioners. Um, we have these hybrid practitioners that are have a foot in a, in, in a, in a subject matter area such as aerospace engineering. Uh, they're pedigreed aerospace engineers. Uh, who also are um, either pedigreed computer scientists or have a strong background in computation. Um, and these are individuals who are acquainted with agile techniques, DevSecOps tools and practices, uh, who are proficient coders, um, who know about style, how to follow style guides and, and development co and coding standards. Um, and these are a really, really important part of our uh, performer team uh, because they can work with again, with decision makers, with, with subject matter experts, with software engineers at this cross section to say, here's what the tools need to do in order for us to um, ensure, for example, that we have proper insight into an inspection and repair process at a depot, or that this new design for this new rotor that's being developed in the aerospace systems uh, directorate um, can be shared, can be included in a broader product structure, has that level of interoperability. These data engineers can test all of that. It doesn't have to be passed through different separate isolated functions. It's all wrapped on, into one under one, uh, on one nice bow. Uh, this, is, this has been a huge area of, of, of expansion and value delivery for us. But in addition to these different core capability areas, we have some products we've already talked about, um, Evolve and Hyperthought which are both production grade, Evolve lives in platform one, HyperThought lives in Google Cloud, um, and also on the, the RDT and Dren network. Um, we do have our CI CD, we have two CI CD pipelines that we run both on uh, the Dren network and then also up in Google Cloud. And then of course we have the pipeline supporting Evolve in platform one. Um, we have the ability to spin up fast and light, what I like to refer to as fast and light capabilities uh, in Google Cloud. And one of the things that Hangar 18 does is we, and you'll see this on the next slide, we'll talk about more specific details about our products and services, is that when Hangar 18 engages with a potential customer, we try to right size the problem and then we try to right size the solution. We try to define the problem such that we can right size the, the solution. Platform one is not the, the necessarily the best fit for every problem, especially when we look at, again, that citizen developer uh, that represents a broad, a, a broad portion of our, our customer base. Uh, the lead times, the fee structure in that environment is is a burden that for many is simply too much to, to overcome. So instead, what we're able to do is work with our local AOs here in AFRL uh, in a Google in, in the Google environment to develop again what we refer to as fast and light software TE. If somebody wants to test a new library, we can do that. We can give them an environment to test this new uh, Julia Go Rust Python library, whatever it might be, spin that asset down. And then they can take their they can take their results with them. It's a, it's a very much a great uh, experimental environment for them. Um, and so one of the things we recognize is that many of these problems have unique characteristics that demand for creative solution uh, development. It's not all just going to be one pipeline, one cloud environment, uh, one development approach. Uh, it very much depends. Um, so it's one of the things we're very happy with is the options that we have that we can refer people to. And so a couple of other items there. Again, these these have all uh, have all um, become uh, become uh, options as a result of us standing them up for ourselves. The productivity tools and the the software and data lifecycle support. It's a little again a little more of a detail here across those those um, those different areas. We spend a lot of time analyzing working with the customer to really analyze the problem from a user-centered design perspective. And I haven't talked about this much so far, but this is one that we are really, really, really passionate about because it is, it is when you look at failure modes in uh, technology development inside the DoD, you know, the GAO reports that have been numerous on this particular topic, that it often comes down to requirements management um, or rather mismanagement, I suppose, and uh, and communication breakdown uh, between the doer of the work uh, and the the owner of the the, the product owner um, effectively. And a lot of this, again, is how we define requirements. You know, we can look at traditional methods of domain modeling uh, and you can see how despite, despite the fact that something may be 
defined and developed as a technically valid solution, it fails to address the, the basic need of the actual end user, you know, the stick figure, if you will, uh, in your use case model. That stick figure is a, is, a, is a person. It's a user that has needs and desires and motivations, uh, and those need to be factored in. And so we've, um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, uh, we are yet again here to show that this is this is a very effective means of um, addressing and defining these these problem spaces to make sure that our solution is right sized. Um, so one of the first things we do is work with our um, our user centered design team uh, to enlist and engage them, even in small projects, even in small projects, and a lot of times even in legacy projects to say we want to better we want to best understand why this application was developed the way that it was. If we're going to inherit a piece of technology, we want to talk to the end users and see what their experience is in using this tool, this platform, and make sure that we're on the right vector uh, for success before Hangar 18 agrees to take it on and deploy it. So the consulting piece can will lead to any one of these other other pieces. And I won't go through every one of these line items, um, but we have a lot of different options in terms of how we engage to deliver to deliver capabilities. Um, and we like that, you know, we like to have flexibility in, in, that, in, the, in those product offerings and um, to be able to tailor solutions uh, to the needs of, of the individual or the individual team. The bottom one's kind of interesting too, when we talk about education and training, this is actually a really good example where having options is really nice. Um, sometimes, as I mentioned before, we'll sit down with a practitioner a researcher, let's say, or, or an engineer um, who's working a particular problem and we'll talk to them about the, the, the fundamentals of, of relative estimation and how they can employ that to, to better manage their own workload and give their leadership confidence in their ability to deliver um, on a particular timeline. Um, it's not black magic, <laughs> as, as I'm sure most of you will agree, um, but it's, it, it's not always properly employed. Um, so again, those are th these informal sessions are, are uh, for us, are, are free of charge. Uh, we regularly engage with members of our community in those. Uh, among the, the workshops that we have, we have, you go to our website at hangar18.io, um, which does work best uh, if, you're, if you're not on VPN, if you're on a Nipper machine, um, because it's hosted out of Google. Um, and so uh, our monthly workshop schedule is posted there along with other AMAs for the different products that we have, as well as, as Hangar 18 itself. Uh, but those workshops are, are free and are very, very informative across a variety of different topics. And those are generally sponsored by AFIP, um, again, who are the educational uh, partners and, and uh, the, the, the other half of, of Hangar 18. Uh, that third one's kind of interesting too. As I mentioned, you know, we don't own the uh, billets for Hangar 18. So instead, what we've done is work with the AFRL Human Capital Group uh, to work with loaning organizations to sign an MOU that takes a person with a particular skill set and allows them to come and work with Hangar 18 for between six and 18 months. Um, this can happen a couple of different ways. Sometimes individuals will come to us and just say, hey, I want to get plugged in. Um, their sponsoring organization is very supportive of this. Again, because we have the tools to monitor their work and report that back so that they can be properly rewarded for all their great contributions. Um, sometimes they'll have a project they're already working on. Somebody, we, we have one right now where somebody come, come, has come to us and said, hey, I have this great idea. I'm not really sure how I should execute this. And we're like, well, bring it in as a project in, under the Hangar 18 umbrella and we'll get you plugged in and you can spend your year, 18 months with us uh, executing this particular project. Um, it's really a win-win uh, for all organizations. I mean, again, this, this, this allows us to move, move uh, quickly uh, in directions that make sense to, to, to deliver the most value. Uh, the downside, of course, of this model is that we don't have um, we don't have a core budget. So we're a fee for service organization. Um, what that means is that, of course, a percentage of each project that we run, that funding will go into supporting the, the procurement of productivity tools and bringing in support staff to help us uh, with community engagement, uh, managing our marketing, you know, the, the where we do actually do our work um, and all the support needed therein. Um, so again, it's a trade space, but we're actually very happy with it. It's very exciting. We have um, a total of, we have three that have been on, onboarded so far. We have three more in the pipeline. No, four more in the pipeline uh, come, looking to come on board and work with Hangar 18. So uh, this is the, the shameless plug here. If anybody here is interested in working with a software factory, um, I'm not a vendor, so I think I'm still within the rules here, <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> I hope I am. Uh, to say if anybody here is interested in, in, in you know, participating with Hangar 18 uh, under this kind of a model where you can come and learn new skills and um, bring your own skills to bear and augment them and what we do what we refer to as leveling up uh, that skill set, um, reach out to us, please. Here's a brief snapshot of where we are presently. 
um, as of really this week, that we have a, a, a good deal more pending funding, but this is what we have on contract in our first eight months. Um, it's grown significantly uh, from a $1 million pathfinder. Um, and I've got a little snapshot there um, of the types of the big projects that we're working on. We're working on a data fabric project for AFRL. Uh, we're working on tech data and digital engineering tools and practices for the attributables program in AFRL. Um, working on uh, documentation that helps practitioners understand best practice, um, how better to manage their own data for their own success. And of course, th these types of projects are run over a broad array of organizations. We have a, one, one member of our team is, a, is an individual lieutenant, uh, Zach Ryan, working under Dar Dr. Mark Reith. I think Dr. Reith on this call. Um, and Lieutenant Ryan is building out a network graph for ourselves and other factories like Space Camp that shows all of the different connections um, that, that are had between partner organization, collaborators, um, customers, stakeholders, members of our own organization inside of our performer network. You can see just a snapshot of the ones that we work with. And again, this is all in about 10 months of time uh, that we've been able to really, maybe even shorter than that, it's really been 2022 that we've brought on um, this funding for these new contracts. And our outlook for the next year is, uh, is this is going up by several factors um, um, here uh, in again in the next year. And that this is all spread out over these different efforts. And so you can say, well, how do we manage all this? Well, we have um including our including the interns that we have we have about 10 people in our leadership group uh and operational group who are civilian civilian and military and we're supported by about four or five dozen um contractors uh inside of this organization not all these not not all of these efforts are enterprise some of them are much much smaller you know sometimes it's an individual touch point with a graduate student who is looking to deploy um, a serious game up to Google Cloud for t &E purposes, that use case we mentioned before. So we have some that are very large, some that are very small, um, and everything in between. This is a little bit of motivation. I think I've covered some of this already. And I think, again, this particular group that we're talking to will appreciate this. Uh, there's no shortage of ambition when it comes to what we want to do with our data uh, in the DoD, specifically the Air Force. Um, but it's heavily data, de data dependent. As many of you will appreciate if you've ever done data science, the vast majority of that work is in acquisition, cleansing, normalizing, synthesizing data so that it is ready for analysis. It is ready to generate a statistic uh, or a, a, uh, a training set around. And in so many cases, this is just this is just not the case. We have may have two or three builds worth of data that we can compare. It's just not enough. So one of the things Hangar 18 does is while we're bringing tools and practices to bear, we codify this in the form of data management playbooks and approaches that can be distributed to the community to say, when you're going on contract to gather fabrication data, uh, whether you're machining data, test and characterization data, simulation data, whatever it might be, here's how you build a, a practical approach to gathering that data so that it can be used for these other types of of purposes, you know, as one example, we went. We have a project with an analytics company um, in the Bay Area, and we're attempting to do um, recurrent neural nets uh, for sequential learning on predicting material properties based on certain build conditions. Pretty cool project, uh, but we just don't have enough build data at this point. And the contract was was barely written sufficient that we could sneak in and say, "Hey, maybe we can get a few more, you know, like a dozen, two dozen more." Builds worth of data in this, but but the challenge is the stakeholders didn't go into it expecting that they would want to use their data in this way, and so it wasn't sufficiently modeled, captured, and exchanged. Um, so this is an area again where we see a huge opportunity. Easy lifts. This isn't really hard stuff for them to do. Um, they just need to be proactive in thinking about it and making sure that they have an agreement with their contractor and there's room in the budget to do it. And of course, Hangar 18 is here as an option for them to engage with too. To say we can help you define what that compelling use case is, what that compelling research question is, and what you need to do to model the data to support and capture and deliver the data to support this use case or research question. You know, we're not the ones who are who are delivering condition-based maintenance, but we are uh, proposing an engagement with Rapid Sustainment Office as we speak to help them build a more durable, reliable, serialized data footprint around their parts so that they can actually execute this this digital dream around condition-based maintenance really cool stuff really cool stuff um, so i hope everybody here can resonate with that um, that this is this is our this is our niche 
in Hangar 18, building out that really strong foundation in data and using the right tools and methods so that we can get up and, and, and really realize this, these ambitious goals. And I see a ton of, I see the chat, there's a bunch of questions in the chat. I don't know if it's best for us to stop now. Do you have a preference on that, uh, Lindsay and, and company? Um, is that, it's really up to you if you see some questions that you want to answer. Otherwise, we're tracking them if you want to continue on and we can do them after. It's your, it's your choice. Okay. Well, I've just got a couple more things here. I'm almost done. Um, this is all well documented, what we have here um, in terms of creating a, a model for learning and, 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 and adaptiveness inside of our own factory that we can propagate out and to encourage people to start small, fail fast and learn quickly. Um, one of the things that we deal with in the research community, especially since we're working at low levels of maturity from a technology perspective, uh, is that people are often very concerned and, and frankly afraid to model an immature process or to model an immature or, or not well understood concept. We encourage them to do that anyway even if it's on a paper napkin. And we can evolve that over time to where, you know, we have seen projects literally form up around a, a paper napkin with ink scribbled on it into a JSON-based hierarchical process model that has 4,000 nodes and 100,000 individual properties that is fully explorable. It's really, really exciting stuff. Um, so again, it's this learning model, move quick. Every project that we do uh, subscribes to uh, the Agile model of standing up, getting a stand-up team, rallying around a common vision, um, and moving forward quickly to illuminate what's in front of us while keeping an eye several sprints ahead on what's coming down the pike, communicating often with our, our, with our stakeholders and the end users. Um, and it, it, again, it's a model that works. I think everybody here probably would, would resonate with that as well. Um, and here's a couple of success stories across those different uh, horizontals that I mentioned earlier. Um, and again, in some cases, these are, you can see that that first one, deploying a serious game up for T&E purposes to Google Cloud um, at IL2 uh, was very, very quick, very, very uh, no brainer investment of energy from our perspective. But what it led us to do is to consider the, consider the deployment of a full on game deployment framework uh, for doing learning better. And I, I'm not the expert here, um, Dr. Reith is, and you can speak to this more. Um, if you guys have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out to him. Um, but it's an exciting expansion of that capability that, that has a lot of value for the organization. You know, we wanna get away from the, <laughs> the Rock'em Sock'em robots and, and Jeff, the torqued off system admin, who's always telling us to stop giving our data away, you know, during the, uh, the InfoSec training that we all take. Um, and then across consulting, one of, the, one of the really fun things that we, you know, you, you never like to see a, a prototype or preliminary phase not go the way that people want, but that's one of our promises has been that we can come alongside and consult when, so, because this does happen, right, where a, a decision maker, a PM will get some funding, they'll go on to contract, they'll start marching down this road and go, whoops, we didn't write this contract right for the delivery of data and software. We can carve out a small slug, uh, maybe maybe uh, some some fallout funds or something like that that we can give to bring Hangar 18 on as a consultant. This has happened is happening as we speak. We come alongside. We can just like the customer can tell. We can tell that they're they may not be getting exactly what they want because things weren't written appropriately in the contract. But what we can do is help build out a rich requirements baseline and a data footprint, so that when they reach their decision gate when the MVP is delivered in this originally scoped contract, they can say, you know, this really isn't going the way that we want. We want to halt the development of this particular MVP and work with Angry Team as a preferred partner who this whole time have been working to, to using a UCD process to define requirements and using data, our data engineering team to build out the schemas, data dictionaries, et cetera, um, logical and physical models of all the data so that we can continue to roll this thing out in additional phases. So consulting oftentimes will turn into um, full on efforts for Hangar 18 um, to help write a, a project that may have gone off course. Um, data engineering, same thing. The big takeaway here, in addition to being able to plug, plug these students from AFIT into actual AFRL programs, which is really exciting to see, we want to develop an economy of scale there in a big way that we do that is in providing guidance for best practices and approaches for how to manage data, um, develop goals and objectives around data, 
and then uh, build models and data acquisition pipelines and tools and methods uh, to satisfy the objectives of the effort. And of course, this may be something as simple as we want to make sure we have a durable product model that comes out of a PLM system. We don't know how to do this. So Hangar 18 can step in and help them with that as we have been doing over the last several years. And then this last one here is once again, we build out our own capabilities in different, uh, using different cloud platforms, using different technologies, and the community benefits from that because we can then offer it to them as a product or a service. Um, because we're not, not only are we federated, we also have a large uh, community of collaboration, uh, community of practice, and um, um, this allows us to engage with organizations of those 50-ish 50, 50 organizations I mentioned earlier. They all fall along that spectrum. Some are organizations we talk with fairly regularly, others we give quarterly updates to. Um, so it just depends on the level of engagement that, that people want as far as coming to colliders and workshops, providing project resources, being a, being a, a uh, um, being a sensor for us for demand signals um, it just depends on how they want to engage There's a lot of flexibility there uh, here's our structure of how we work um, myself uh, director of cto colonel blair Watkinson, ryz is a senior advisor uh, mr matt dever is our chief of education and training he's on uh, on the line here sorry chief of outreach and, uh, outreach and communication i should say outreach and communication that's mr matt dever um, and then our chief of ops, our chief of education and training, and then Dr. Mark Reith is on the call, I believe. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this lieutenant is doing all this really great work in um, quantifying this, um, this network of interactions between our factory and all the other organizations we work with. And what's really cool is this same lieutenant has done a lot of this work with the other factories as well. And the networks bear a lot of similar, uh, bear a lot of, bear a lot of similarities um, in the number of, of edges between nodes when you look at primary, secondary, and tertiary relationships, that same model that I just mentioned about how that community of practice uh, is, it varies based on level of engagement. The other factories see that a lot as well, as well as the types of money, how the money moves through the factory, how we uh, acquire resources and matrix them out. Um, again, a lot of similarities between factories. So that's one key takeaway for this call here today is that the model works, especially if you let um, the factories self-assemble. Um, there is some concern over that, right, that you're going to have Maybe these are all these rogue organizations off doing their own thing. But interestingly enough, there's something in the water that keeps us all uh, working in the same direction, um, which is a really good thing. Uh, getting close to the end here, I did want to take a second to I talk a little bit about quantifying um, quantifying the problem space around the desired outcome uh, outcomes to say, what is the compelling research question that you're getting after? Uh, what is the objective? Um, of the data collection effort. You know, we're an AFRL. We don't build planes. Um, our information and knowledge is our, is our product. That is what our consumers consume. Um, it's not physical items. Um, it's information, it's knowledge. Um, and so for us, we have to build this model so I put, that allows us to, to get ahead of this because we're not doing a good enough job. I put this together a few years back and have been refining it over time and complementing this with having the team uh, continue to build out this guidance underneath this overall framework. And one of the things that's interesting here is we borrowed from the Agile Manifesto to say that again, so working software is not our only measure of progress. The data and the models that are derived from the data are also um, primary measures of progress. Because when we look at the different failure and success modes in software, and how agile practice can help that. Again, we see the same benefit with data. Uh, it would be no different if you were building a technical data package for some sort of optimizing some structural component for an aircraft. Um, this is an engineering design problem. Um, there's going to be data that's, data that's delivered. There's absolutely no reason for us to write a contract that, that requires us to wait three years to start looking at that data. It should be de delivered early. It should be analyzed by all parties. It should be kept in a format that's, that's neutral and interoperable um, and that is captured and stored in a way that doesn't break the data model. Uh, I won't get spun up on exactly uh, what I mean there. Just pick technologies that aren't going to obliterate um, the relationship between the objects that you're trying to collect and the properties they're in. Um, and again, this is, this is kind of the Hangar 18 sweet spot when we talk about bringing these practices um, and also, for example, thinking about DevSecOps too for a minute with data, what the security posture is around different the different data that you're collecting, even down to the element level. This happens all the time where somebody comes into an environment and says, oh, uh, well, we have a problem with 
um, we have a problem with uh, you know aggregating data, and it might it might it might end up being at a higher level of classification. We say, well, do you have an SRG or something like that, some sort of a doc, some sort of documentation that can help? Well, no, we don't. We weren't anticipating that. Well, when we think about again, we would be doing this with software. How will the data be used once it's operational? What are the runtime constraints, the exchange and transaction constraints, the consumption constraints, what are the security constraints, access controls? Factor all those things early. Um, again, a lot of our work is around this, especially when we talk about data engineering, kind of a unique flavor for us in Hangar 18. And it, we'll, you'll see there, FAIR, iterate until FAIR is inside of that, that cycle. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Those are the criteria that we use to say, yes, we did a good enough job with our data because we can reuse it and we can not just reuse it and, 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 and validate the findings in the data, uh, which is a, uh, a DOD uh, requirement, by the way, that data be collected this way. It's, it's very difficult to actually comply with that mandate, however. It's not just able to be reused, but it's able to be used uh, or replicated. It's able to be used to, uh, to uh, begin new and, and uh, additional explorative research, which is really, really exciting. So I'll pause here. Um, this is kind of the end of what I wanted to talk about today with you guys. So I'll talk to some of these questions in here. Yes, we'll have the slides, no problem. Good, good. Yeah, so when you talk about the different data fabrics, um, one of the projects that we have, uh, interoperability is really important for us. So API first development and then having, an, having a sufficiently exposed and documented data model. Uh, we've done this demonstration before between uh, in different multi-cloud options. Um, we're paying for the software licenses anyway, and we're paying for VMs inside of these cloud environments. And there is some amount of sunk cost for sure uh, in some cases around um, uh, setup systems, of, setup and administration for sure. We recognize that. Um, however, for a lot of cases, you know, when we work with um, a supplier of data, who's using their own corporate cloud, or they may be using AWS to host all of our material data management that's collected under this effort. You know, we can't, at this point, you know, they're already using this. This contract has been, has been let. We can't change course here. So instead what we do is we need to contend with the fact that we have a system like our system HyperThought running in Google Cloud. They have a system, maybe Material Center, uh, running in AWS. So we need to explore those APIs, get documentation for the data models, and begin to transact the data as early as possible. Again, that's consistent with the slide that we have right here. So our intention as we move towards our building our, our own data fabric inside of AFRL is to take that same approach um, so that when these, when you're looking at these other, the, the big six, when information is desired from our node in this landscape of fabrics or this fabric of fabrics that we have a sufficiently exposed data model basically in the form of registered registered schemas and data dictionaries that says what's inside of our ecosystem so when we receive requests for financial data for contractor data for air cleanliness data for structural data uh, we can return that very quickly uh, and it's fairly seamless it's all driven through api gateways um, and it's managed through um, a, a zero trust approach the big, the big challenge that we have there, honestly, is not zero trust and it's not API management and it's not per boundary or perimeter security. Our biggest issue is, is in quantifying the data and the schemas that, that uh, represent the data so that exploration coming in either from the outside or even from the inside, if, if, it, if an end user is asking a question inside this data fabric that we have sufficient knowledge of our own content that we can answer it and that we can synthesize it. Um, because again, I don't want to get spun off here on a tangent, but as I'm sure you'll appreciate, there are many ways to assert certain facts that are valid, um, especially in, in uh, the engineering domains uh, from, a, from a, like a mechanical properties perspective. There are numerous ways to assert uh, modulus of elasticity. But we need, to, we need to find a way, and there are, there are, and I'm not suggesting that we're doing this in a novel way. We're not splitting the atom here. This has been done before um, in a lot of good ways. So we're partnering with other or, uh, uh, organizations to help make sure that, again, that data footprint is maximally interoperable so that it doesn't matter if we want to lift and shift the cloud that we're using we're going to try to be cloud agnostic here we can lift and shift our footprint through different uh, uh, repositories databases and even cloud environments and it's so the next one there uh, google cloud is fantastic for fast and light we have great coverage from our our local ao we got great support from general pringle 
Um, I don't know what the future looks like as far as moving beyond IL-4, um, especially when it comes to things like um, you know, IL-6 and 7 applications, or even IL-5. And there is a concern around ITAR data. But if you're not familiar with AFRL, you know, our, the Google domain that we are supporting has 13,000 users in it. It's a very large community. Um, and their needs generally do not fall into even IL-4. Most of what they're doing, they aim to publish. Um, so that's IL-2. And so having those types of lightweight capabilities, code repositories, productivity tools, content management systems that can be hosted to let them do their work quickly with collaborators inside and outside the fence is a huge win. Um, and it's very, very cost effective. So again, Google Cloud isn't for everybody. I understand for a lot of DoD and Air Force programs, it's not a good fit. Uh, but when you look at the nature of the innovative research done in, in the lab, um, I've never seen anything quite as, as effective. All right, any work in data discovery for mission unique data points across undocumented enterprise data holdings? Um, I'm not certain what is meant by undocumented enterprise data holdings. Can you clarify that? Yeah, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, hi. Uh, so undocumented data holding. So I have a mission uh, that has a lexicon of behaviors or things that I'm looking for within the data. But there's so much data out there in the Air Force. I don't know which data sets to even start looking mm. for. I know that are a quality of data services for my unique mission set. So the ability to automate that so that a mission can provide that lexicon and then they can be told what the quality of data services is across all the data. Yeah. Data. Yeah, that's a, that's part of the team that we have as part of our data fabric effort. I think I, I think I'll say again, I think they have the hardest job uh, for sure. Uh, because like you said, what we're trying to, I've tried for years to build tools that allow the practitioner to define those dictionaries and lexicons, thesauri, whatever it might be. Um, we've tried formal taxonomies, we've used folksonomies, <laughs> we've used all, you know, all kinds of techniques and tools. I think our goal at this point is to automate as much as possible so where we can gather representative data to, to begin forming, even if it's a partial schema or a lexicon to represent a particular domain. And then over time, I think this is the big opportunity and this is where we're making some headway, is in augmenting that the model or the schema based on new findings inside of new data sets that may have certain permutations. As I said before, there are a number of different ways to assert um, mechanical properties. As we discover new artifacts that that um, are have that have valid asserted properties that we weren't we aren't expecting, it does require some info, input from the user. Of course, it does. Um, but bootstrapping basically those dictionaries, those controlled vocabularies based on source material is right now where we're focusing um, to do exactly what you're describing. Um, we're focused principally in uh, bioinformatics and additive manufacturing um, because there's a lot of support at the national level for defining, for building preliminary vocabularies for those domains. Um, it's a big challenge and I'd love to report back when we have a little bit more success, but that, that definitely is an area that we're looking at. Because I, again, I think that's what's going to make this, this data fabric successful um, is being able to reconcile, not just know, not just be able to respond in individual cases. Yes, I found a file for a mechanical test that matches your parameters, perhaps uh, for my study that I'm doing on um, topology optimization, let's say for this wing surface. Uh, but to be able to synthesize data that is um, uh, not that it, that is potentially disjointed or not um, consistently described. Uh, so lots more to come there. Excellent question. What have you done about decreasing the friction of getting non-classified telemetry data from AFNET and backhauling it to the cloud? Well, we're not working with the the big six right now, so I'd, I'd have to say nothing at this point. Um, our our um, we are looking at at Blade um, using Blade for um, housing data um, from Tinker Air Force Base, so there will be some of that as far as 
yeah, non-classified telemetry data from AFNET. So much of what we do has been focused on on the research side, on the RDT and uh, DREN network, um, that we haven't really had to encounter this problem. So I don't want to oversell any kind of a response here. Um, we anticipate this being an issue with just getting basic user access to some of our resources. As if you're on AFNET and you're trying to get to Google Cloud, you know, it's a, it's a crapshoot <laughs> right now, um, which is one of the reasons why we're moving most of our digital engineering capabilities into um, Cloud One for that exact reason, uh, that it should make for an easier user experience. Um, so yeah, that, that would be, unfortunately, that's the kind of a limitation of my response at this point. Oh, wow, look at that. Anonymous user. <laughs> Uh, if I wanted to join Hangar 18 as an intern or st uh, st uh, stakeholder, uh, where should you, where should I start? What should I expect? Uh, well, so to expand a little bit about what I was talking about earlier uh, on the Air Force STEM uh, recruitment site, um, there are job postings, and what I'll do actually, well, I'll send this. I'll, I'll make sure to, to send this out to you guys with the slides. Uh, well, it'll go. I'll make sure to send it so it can go out with the slides. Um, certainly, reach out to us uh, myself. Um, or Matt Dever, um, or Dr. Reese, Dr. Mark Reese. Um, there's my email address there in the chat. Um, so that's a good place to start. So, it's, and and if you're if you're if you can if you knew or somebody else find the uh, STEM post, and by all means, it's a good way to apply. But we've had actually had people just reach out through our support email on our website at hangar18.io and ask about getting involved in Hangar 18. Um, so it's pretty easy to do. Um, and so as far as what to expect, you know, that's, we, ha we have a, an onboarding process that talks about um, how we do business. So how Hangar 18 makes decisions. One of the first thing, one of the things that uh, the leadership team, myself and, and Matt and Mark and the others have done over the last eight months is said, how does Hangar 18 conduct its business? What are our processes? When we walk into a room with a vendor what are the criteria we use to, to, to form a, a go, no go decision or with a potential customer? Is this a good fit for us? Um, this, this, this problem that they're bringing to the table, is this something we think that we can solve or maybe we can augment it? You know, again, when, when we were talking to the rapid sustainment office, they're already doing a lot of great work in algorithm development for condition-based maintenance. So it was looking for those kind of those, those gaps potentially where we could slide in and fit so that we're not, you know, taking over their mission, we're augmenting it with our own skills and capabilities. So getting new members of the Hangar 18 crew, first you have to decide whether you're an astronaut or an alien. You have to make that decision. Pick your faction. That's probably the hardest choice. <laughs> the hardest thing you have to do if you join Hangar 18. Um, and the next piece after that, again, is, is learning what our approach is to user-centered design, uh, our flavors of Agile, how we approach Agile as a practice, uh, DevSecOps, getting familiar with the pipeline. Now, some of this depends on, on, on what level of engagement you're interested in. You know, we... The, the four job postings that we have out right now are for a project engineer slash project manager. That would be somebody employing agile techniques to help lead matrix resources, delivering solutions. We also have senior and junior full stack engineering, software engineering, and we have users, user centered design. But the reality is, is we really need help across the board, human resources, marketing, um, design, testing, cloud, cloud architecture, data science, data engineering. Those postings will be coming out soon as we refine them. So depending on the nature of the role, we get the the new the new resource, the new team member spun up on on what that codified practice is, and where they're fit, where they will fit rather. Now, if they're bringing a project, uh, which is one that we have that we're working on right now to try to bring this individual in, and, and there there's it's a bring your own project um, type of a start, it, it adds a little bit of a unique flavor um, because we're going to employ existing. Um, Hangar 18 resources to help them quantify and, and solidify that problem space um, so that they can be successful using our tools and methods on their project that they're bringing. And in some ways it, it accelerates a little bit because they probably they already have an idea of what they want to be, of what they want to do, and they have much closer contact. So um, again, it just kind of depends. It's kind of a Plinko board. It depends on the type of work that you want to do. Um, if you're working in the, in the cloud architecture space, you're going to get paired up with our, our uh, stable of, of cloud uh, developers and architects that we already have. Um, working in a potentially in a platform uh, that could be working on the Google side, um, working in 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 um, Azure could be AWS. It just depends. Um, we have all three that we maintain right now, 
um, and that are building towards. Google is for sure our strongest offering right now, but we are in the, in the process of building out an AWS GovCloud with a, a local partner um, under, their, under the compliant framework that they've developed, uh, and then developing an Azure environment out in Cloud One as well. Um, again, th those are primarily for more mature technologies and specifically for digital engineering capabilities that need to be served up through virtual desktop infrastructure. Uh, because as many of you know, tools like Team Center, Ansys, uh, those are desktop applications. Um, so giving those a, a secure runtime environment. Good question. Any others? All right, hearing none, I want to extend a gracious thank you for joining us today and for your wonderful presentations. We do appreciate it. Um, thank everyone else for taking the time to attend today's program. With the support of our DOD innovators, Innovation Connect has become a success. We look forward to spotlighting more innovative projects in the future. Approved videos of our Innovation Connect events are available on the Department of the Air Force CDIO YouTube page. If you have a future topic for Innovation Connect, please send your recommendations to Ms. Ty Daniel and our team will review your proposal. Also, please follow our LinkedIn and Twitter accounts for more information. This concludes today's Innovation Connect. Our next Innovation Connect is set for um, next month, the 15th of September, and we will feature the partnership between the Air Force Research Laboratory and Cyber Advisors to deliver innovation across the DAF. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.